bottle size and quantity effect. Firstly, large bottles, magnums, are often demonstrated before standard 75 CL bottles. Larger bottles are weighted better for wine, resulting in the difference of rarity. For both reasons, calculators tend to institute higher bids and justifies why, international, why initial bids are high. Secondly, later lots have more bottles, so price slash bottle falls at, as the marginal utility of the additional bottles would be less than that of the initial bottles. Willingly, it could divulge how transaction costs of reselling extra bottles increases. The absentee effect. Approx approximately 60% of auction results of all the lots being sold to absentees. Roughly 31% sales are to absentees as well as those present and the remaining 9% are only to those present. When al analyzing by lots, the discovery that 82% of winning lots were sold to absentees. One explanation for this abnormal situation is that wine is a low-valued item and so the transport cost of attending is high. As a result, this effect interprets itself on why prices decline. First, it becomes transparent that the auctioneer will focus on bids in a declining value order. Secondly, absentee bidders cannot congregate information on feeling or the sentiment in the room. Synergy slash complementary effects. Discovered by Branco in 1997, note that the synergy effect is based on the focus of returns. For bidders that are present, this may be applicable to them. For example, if there are synergies in sequential action, individuals who recognize or value synergies would be willing to pay higher for the first. If they do win the first slot, they are presumably they presumably pay for the lower or the second lot due to the second lot willing to pay more than the standalone value. This idea can be similar to the logic a buyer may want to acquire all of the bottles and consume one bottle a year to determine how the bottle ages. The consumer surplus effect. This concept arrives from selling goods in an auction that institutes to the seller to the different consumers' capability to bid sufficiently. Consumer surplus is effectively explained by explained if the auction price is greater than the market clearing price. This results if the individual with the highest marginal utility would decrease their quantities, thus the individual with less for the second one. Limitations slash wait and see. Limitations, this thought describes that an individual arrives late and misses the auction of the first would theoretically make the hammer price of the of increase. Problem is if bidders adapt to this idea, prices effectively increase or decrease, which leads to understanding of risk aversion. Wait and see. Risk neutral traders would expect the same price in two sequential markets, only true if there is preferred competition. Along, as long as there are a limit, limited number of bidders and a form of transaction costs of retrading, then the total demand would decrease. So the subsequent information effect. Participants during the initial round are allowed to be informed of the stage where other bidders dropped out of the bidding process. It's also fair to infer that each bidder will bid at their maximum at the end of the first scan, and the bidders will therefore know the limits of the second and third highest bidders. For clarity, if we assume that the first bidder is happy and withdraws, the second bidder should only bid to the degree of the third bidder's limit, knowing the third, limit, the third bidder should not exceed their limit. This can result in the hammer price falling even further between the first and second options. Uh, next to the idea of the collusion formation. This idea can apply when a number of individuals are at a wine auction and don't know each other. Consequently, during the process of bidding, they may socialize and get to know each other or even recognize bidders that they met in the past at previous auctions. The application of socialization occurs, but it may take time. Therefore, in repeat or sequential auctions, the probability of collusion would certainly increase. Once collusion occurs, it will lead to, re it will lead to reduced prices. Uh, next is the loss aversion effect. So people dislike losing. Essentially, this idea says that individuals weigh losses more heavily than they weigh gains. So if you lose $1,000, you're going to weigh that more heavily than if you were to win $1,000. Therefore, there's a possibility that after a result of other bidders in the, first, uh, in the first round, many bidders will not bid in the second round due to fear. On the second round of bidding, the third bidder may not even bid proportion to his max level, knowing that the second bidder can go higher. This leads the second bidder uh, to receive the good cheaper than he or she expected. 
the loss of version effect speculates at the downside element of the variance related risk aversion. Uh, this also brings up the question of why don't prices continue to fall? This brings us back to the concept of the expected reserve price. So the sale won't even be completed if the bid doesn't exceed the reserve price, which is unknown to the bidders. Bidders might have a general notion of where the expected reserve price lands, formulated from general market conditions, but they don't have an exact uh, answer to the reserve price. Uh, bidders now need to be careful not to bid too low, because otherwise they'll lose their transportation costs of attending and their opportunity costs. After the first bidder leaves, the second bidder uh, may or may not be accepted if the price falls. One must therefore acknowledge that consumers are risk averse and may or may not be interested in taking further risks. So why is our secondhand wine auction a common value auction? Uh, well, we have a quote here that says, the nature of wines that make it to the secondary market are those that maintain value or increase in value over time. So the value of each wine is identical amongst bidders since secondhand wine auctions are arranged by many major wine auction houses such as Christie's and Sotheby's. Prices for many wines at these auctions are used as a price indication for collectible wines when traded through other channels. A typical example for this might be when negotiants sell mature wines from their stock to restaurants. So to set up, we made a baseline model to run a regression. Um, first, in a secondhand wine auction, bidders pay reflecting the hammer's price, which is similar to paying at the first price. Uh, in a secondhand wine auction, each one has a range of estimate prices, which is AI, BI. We make AI be the lowest estimate prices, BI be the highest estimate prices. The reserve price for a secondhand wine auction is generally set at a percentage of the low estimate and will not exceed the low estimate of the lot. So here reserve price is K times AI, where K is in between zero and one. Uh, what we can accomplish now is finding the relationship between the reserve prices and the hammer's price. We first made an assumption to simplify this question. Assumption one, the reserve price for a secondhand wine auction is the lowest estimate price. So K is one and R is AI. Then we run regression for the relationship between the hammer's price HI and the lowest estimate price AI to test whether they are linear. We also want to determine the relationship between the hammer's price HI and the highest estimate price is BI. So we use the data from Sotheby's website in the pristine Bergen Burgundy collection, there were a total 462 lots. So the sample size we choose with a 90% confidence level is 59 lots. Um, so we use random between one and 462 to find 59 random numbers between one and 462. And we collect the data for the lowest and highest estimate prices and the bid prices um, as in the picture. So then, according to our regression, we found that bidders do not bid at the lowest estimate price for wine, and they do not bid at the highest estimate price for wine as well. So, um, to test the winner's curse, we made our second assumption. We assume that the second-hand wine auction is a common value auction, which means the actual value of each wine for sale is the same for everyone. We assume EI is 0.5 times AI plus 0.5 times BI to be the expected common value for one I. We then calculate the average profit or payoff per winner, which is negative 1,827. So there indeed a winner's curse on average. Since we do not know the number of bidders in, a pod, in an open auction, we can only say that a bidder must bid a smaller fraction of the expected value to avoid the winner's curse in the wine auction. All right, at the end of the day, should you participate in the wine auction? The answer is yes. If you want to do this, do your research beforehand on catalogs to understand your preference. There are many times of wines out there. And don't worry, many first time visitors report that you spend too much money or, or they're too afraid at all to bid. You can also have in mind as a bidder that the value of one you hold is better be collected, esteemed, or shared with friends, rather it to be actively traded. You may ask, how is fine wine an investment? To be simple, some wines are, do appreciate. Supply seems limited, but as a result, demand grows. And surprisingly, there's a liquid market in wine. 
clean details, the auction design has been deemed sensitive to detail and context, so it doesn't alarm bidders. You should consider certain economic details such as gender, income, and consumption habits when have a significant impact. And remember as a bidder, take into consideration of all fees and costs of obtaining the wine. Also, importantly, know your budget as bidding may take a toll on you. In the end, study the market based on previous auctions to capitalize your chances of winning. And most importantly, beware of auction houses playing against bidders and strategically rearranging loss to maximize profit.